Alrighty guys, so we're going to be starting into our new unit on kinetics and equilibrium. I'm going to be showing you some things which we kind of introduced back when we did phase changes in energy, but we're going to refresh your memory because it's certainly been a while. So chemical kinetics is concerned with the rates of chemical reactions and their mechanisms or pathways. This is something that's particularly important in real world chemistry. If you own a factory and you need to make a certain chemical, you want to make sure that you're making it at both the quickest rate but also the safest way that you can. And we're going to look at ways that that can be manipulated. Now, how do we define reaction rate? Reaction rate is the change in the concentration of a substance, looking at reactant versus product over time. You can think of it like a seesaw. When I start out a reaction, all I have is a reactant. I don't have any product yet. But as my amount of reactant goes down, it's because I'm using it up to make my product. And because of that, that difference between the amount of change is our reaction rate. Now, chemical reactions themselves, when we've been writing out all these chemical reactions all year, they show the overall or the net reaction. There may be many tiny intermediate or small reactions in that reaction that are not shown. These are not expressed, nor are they shown in the final net chemical equation. All those intermediate steps, we leave them out. We show you the start, we show you the end. So let's talk about energy in reactions. The way that we can show the energy in a chemical reaction is by using a potential energy diagram. We used heating curves to show you the energy in physical changes, in the physical change of a phase change. Now we're going to be using potential energy diagrams to illustrate the potential energy change that occurs in a chemical reaction. So these show if a reaction is endothermic or exothermic. We're going to look at two different types of potential energy diagrams for these. The vertical axis will show us the change in the potential energy. The horizontal axis we're going to refer to as the reaction coordinate, and it shows the progress of our reaction over time. So let's look at one of these energy diagrams together. So we have energy on the y-axis, course of reaction on the x-axis. So our reaction begins, we're at a reactance. It follows through a bump and then it ends at our products. But what does this mean? What is this really showing us? Well, our energy always starts at the level of energy that we have in our reactants, and it ends at the level of energy that we have in our products. What happens in between is the amount of energy it takes to start the reaction. And that's something that we refer to as our activation energy. Our activation energy is defined as the energy that it takes to go from the reactants to the top of our curve. The top of our curve is known as the activated complex. The activated complex is the intermediate step at which the reaction begins to proceed. We need a certain amount of energy to get us there before the reaction will continue. So we're going to define a few of these terms to make sure we really understand them. First, activation energy is sometimes called the E sub A. It is the difference in the energy between where we started in the reactants and the activated complex up at the top of the hill. It's used to bring the reactants together to form that activated complex or that intermediate transition state. Without sufficient activation energy, reactions will not go. All reactions, whether they are endothermic or exothermic, require a small amount of activation energy. If it's a low amount of activation energy, or E sub A, then that reaction is usually exothermic because we didn't need to put a lot in. Let's look at these two reaction curves. Which one of these, the one on the left or the one on the right, would you expect to be endothermic? Which one would you expect to be exothermic? 
Well, our exothermic reaction is our first one. If we look at the size of its activation energy hill, it is much smaller than the other reaction, which is endothermic. Basically, you can think about it like this. If your reactant energy is higher than your product energy, your reaction is exothermic. If your reactant energy is lower than your product energy, then your reaction is endothermic. It takes energy to absorb to get to this point. If you'll notice, our activation energy in our exothermic reaction is much lower than our activation energy in our endothermic reaction. Most chemical reactions are exothermic. Some are endothermic, like photosynthesis, but it's much less common. Our second term we're going to define is the activated complex. The activated complex is an unstable intermediate product that will usually go on to form the products unless that reaction is interrupted. All reactions, whether they are exothermic or endothermic, do require some activation energy. Our third term is heat of reaction. You sometimes see this referred to as delta H. This is the difference between the potential energy of the reactants and the potential energy of our products. It is always symbolized as delta H. If our delta H is negative, our reaction is exothermic. If it is positive, our reaction is endothermic. The mathematical formula for this is energy of reactants minus potential energy of products. Okay, potential energy of reactants minus heat of reaction can be mathematically symbolized by using this formula. Our delta H is our potential energy of our products minus our potential energy of our reactants. Okay, a great way to remember this is pepper, P-E-P-E-R, potential energy of products minus potential energy of reactants, pepper. Remember, all our heat of reactions are found on table I. That's not table one, that's table I. So let's take a look at an exothermic reaction. In this exothermic reaction, you'll see our reactant level of energy is higher than our product level. Let's assign some numbers to this. Let's say that the energy in our reactants is 50 kilojoules, and the energy in our products is 10 kilojoules. If we did this, what would our delta H be? Well, delta H equals the potential energy of the products minus the potential energy of our reactants, pepper. So our delta H would be 10 minus 50, which means our delta H level would be minus 40, which makes perfect sense here because we know a negative delta H means it's an exothermic reaction. Let's talk about catalyzed reactions. Now, you might remember a catalyst is a substance that increases the rate of a reaction by making the reaction easier. It's like what enzymes do for us in our bodies, okay? Now, catalysts lower the activation energy required for a reaction to happen. They lower the height of that hill. They do not eliminate the hill. They just make it smaller. They also do not affect the energy in the reactants or the energy in the products. They only lower the hill. This is gonna be very important to us in just a moment. So catalysts take part in the reaction, but they are not changed by it, which means they can be used over and over and over again without being changed by the reaction itself. So let's look at the effect of a catalyst on the rate of a reaction. Here we have a reaction coordinate shown, potential energy diagram. Is this endothermic or is this exothermic? Because our reactant level of energy is higher than our product level, this means energy is being released. This would be an exothermic reaction. Now. Here is our activation energy with no catalyst at all. Let's look at what happens when we add a catalyst. 
Well, remember, the catalyst lowers the activation energy for our reaction, which means when we add a catalyst, it makes our hill smaller. But one thing I want to point out, our reactants and our product's energy remain the same. They don't change. What's the only part of our potential energy diagram that changed when we added a catalyst? That's right. It's the height of our activation energy. That is the only part, the height of the hill. So there is our activation energy for our catalyzed reaction. Once again, there's our reaction. No catalyst, catalyst. So the term catalyzed reaction just means we're using a catalyst. The term uncatalyzed reaction just means we are not using a catalyst. Two vocabulary terms I want to make sure you're familiar with. So to reiterate, what do you notice about the position of the reactants and the products in the exothermic reaction? What about in this endothermic reaction? What do you notice about the position of the reactants and the products there? If you said in the exothermic the reactants are higher than the products and in the endothermic the reactants are lower than the products, you'd be absolutely correct. Remember, your activation energy in an endothermic potential energy diagram and in an endothermic reaction is much larger than that in an exothermic reaction, and your delta H will be positive because we are taking our products minus our reactants, pepper. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. First, which of these four diagrams represents an endothermic potential energy diagram? One, two, three, or four? Our correct answer here is two. One would be an exothermic potential energy diagram, and quite frankly, three and four, they aren't anything that ever happens at all. Remember, our activation energy is always higher than our reactants or our products. Let's look at example five. Given this reaction, where A plus B become C, does this diagram illustrate an exothermic or an endothermic reaction? Great. State one reason in terms of energy to support your answer. So if you said this is an endothermic reaction because it has a very high activation energy or because the amount of energy in the products is much higher than that in the reactants, you would be correct. Now, if we were to draw, draw a dashed line to indicate a potential energy curve when this is catalyzed, where should that dotted line go? If we were to draw a line showing where our curve would be in the catalyzed reaction, we would simply lower that activation energy hill. Notice, I didn't change anything about the position of the reactants nor did I change anything about the position of the products. Let's look at example six. Let's take a look at a potential energy diagram, and I'd like for you to tell me which of these four letters, A, B, C, or D, is the potential energy of the reactants, the heat of reaction, the potential energy of the products, and is it endothermic or exothermic? So if you told me that the potential energy of the reactants is A, the heat of the reaction is C, and the potential energy of the products is D, you'd be absolutely correct. And this particular reaction, because the energy in the products is higher than that in the reactants, is an endothermic reaction. So that's it for kinetics for today. We're going to have you do a little bit more practice, and then we're going to dive in to things that can affect the rate of reactions.